Okay, if you, if you Google for diversity, um, you get pictures like this. And um, it's a funny kind of diversity because there are, um, actually, there are some skin color variations, but there's not that much actual diver diversity. And um, they look the same, they act the same, they don't have any um, different kind of, uh, uh, they don't have a fancy hairdo, they don't have anything special. So they are actually very, um, very similar. Um, I do have a bit of a slight issue, one moment. Yes, let's start over. Yeah. Long time ago, I was a young boy. And uh, my parents had the philosophy that it's better to uh, teach children to deal with dangerous tools than to tell them that they shouldn't touch dangerous tools. Right? And it, it, I guess it worked because I have still all my fingers. Um, but this is this pocket knife I got, and my sister also got one. And if you look carefully, you can see the problem with this pocket knife. The problem with this pocket knife is it has no corkscrew bottle opener. My sister's uh, pocket knife did have that, and I hated that. I was like six years old, so I didn't care about actually opening bottles, but I know a missing feature when I see it. So. Uh, and I, I knew it was silly, but still, but still. So, if it was up to me, I got this one. <laughs> this one is hardcore. So, um, that one is such a much better piece of equipment because it can do so much. Just look at it. It can do everything. I can't actually see the bottle opener, but it, I guess it's there. <laughs> it must be there, right? So, in a way, the beauty of a Swiss Army knife is it can do anything, but if you try to do anything with it, it's horrible. It can do effectively nothing. If you open a can with it, it looks like the can was attacked by a shark. And, and if you try to chop, chop an onion, you can't even hold that thing. So, they are actually kind of silly. But at the same time, uh, they are sort of a poster child. A poster child for feature bloat, for features to have because you want to have it, not to actually do the thing. That's like boring. So they, they, they seem to be very much into the feature bloat. And we as industry, as software engineers, we make a lot of Swiss Army knives in our field. And it, it starts like uh, you're really focused. You, you want to make a specific tool. You have really tight, uh, tight specification. You build it, and then the feature requests flow in, and you add it, and you add it. And while every feature is useful, it kind of dilutes all the other features because it will, will be a little bit less suitable for all the other stuff. So at some point, it is nearly, it's like a Swiss army knife in the sense that it is actually good for nothing. So, uh, a, a similar way of looking at this is this expression. We all know this expression. If all you have is a hammer, yeah, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> and um, usually that, um, that is used to indicate that you should use the right tool for the right job but it actually has a bit of a more profound meaning. It means that your thinking influences the choice of tools, but your choice of tools also influences your thinking. And if we move over to if all you have is a Swiss Army knife, where do we end up with this? Because it does not really translate. But my theory is, well, it's not really a theory because I've lived it, you end up with wanting a bigger Swiss Army knife. You always want more. A uh, single-purpose single tools, like a hammer, don't have that problem. 
you, you not look at your hammer, well, it's such a pity I can't open a bottle with it. Well, you can, but not in an elegant way. So you're, it's kind of inevitable that you have the, this feature blown, and at some point you end up with something that is really silly. So um, I'm actually, of course, not really talking about Swiss Army knives. I'm talking about databases, our old friends. Um, they are everywhere, and we grew up with them. And if, if I could start with some history, uh, when we started building applications, it turned out that storing data reliably and quickly is hard. So we didn't want to do it over and over again for every application. So we have a generic data database that can store data, and we just take it. We, we can take that database, and we can uh, build our app around it. So what happened then is that over time, um, those databases turned into really expensive flagship product, products like IBM uh, had one, uh, uh, Oracle, all those databases, and they tried to pack in the features because they wanted to be the best database. And they still do. They still add, add more and more features, and the average application does not use even a f small fraction of them. So feature bloat even there. Um, so what I want to argue today is that it's time to let that feature bloat feeling go and to really focus on what is really what I want to do because it, in many ways it's so much nicer to have a single purpose too. So with that I'll start to introduce myself. I am Frank Leroux. I'm a, I'm a bit of a technology hipster in the sense that I like to use new and shiny uh, technology just before it's actually practical to do so. And that's what my colleagues all around me always say. And I kind of know, but um, it is a strong motivator because if I want to do something with something new and shiny, I work hard. If it's boring, I don't. So it is a human uh, weakness, I guess. So if we look at the traditional uh, stack of uh, application, something like this, a database code in some kind of language and some kind of client. It's, uh, there must be millions of those out there, right? So, um, and if we are talking about those applications and we talk about the code, we talk about the database. We store it in the database. We get it from the database. And I think that is wrong because that's Swiss Army knife thinking. We need to get rid of that notion that there is one place we put everything. I mean, it, it's, it's a very com compelling to do that because then you have everything in one place, but there are also reasons not to do that, and I want to talk about it here. So a, a stack like this kind of derailed, in a sense, over the years because it got more and more difficult to change code, and for that we invented the holy microservice. I'm not going to dwell here long. We know what microservices are, right? Right? <laughs> I'm going to... Yeah, okay. So, um, microservice. The idea of a microservice is, is that we take, we slice a bit of, a, of our application and we uh, only access that application through a networked API. Within that application, we can choose whatever language and technology stack we like and we can use any database we like. And what's in there is just a technical detail, and we slice up our application so that we have all kinds of blobs of microservices, and internally we can uh, swap out different databases. We are much freer in uh, our technology choice because it's not one big thing anymore. So if the application would look, look like something like this, right? Um, so uh, we have here one service that uses Scala and a GraphDB, one that uses Node and a DocumentDB, and one use Java with a nice old SQL data database. So, that, and that's completely fine, and that's like what, uh, what microservices promise, right? If you can everywhere always pick the right tool. So, but if you look at presentations about microservices, mostly they end here. They say, uh, now everything is good. And uh, I believe that for a brief while. And after, because after that while, I, I started thinking about my day-to-day -day problems. And then I noticed that they kind of avoid a certain problem. And that's that different parts of the 
architects need the same data, but in a different, they look at it differently, but it is the same data. You need to share that data between the microservices, but the microservices say, uh-uh, only API calls. So that's not actually that easy to solve, because um, if we look at an example, uh, so we have an application here, for example, has a SQL database, has some code in a language, but it also has a part of analytics that does some aggregation or something about that database. And we have a UI, and we have an analytics UI. Fair enough. So suppose we uh, want to go into microservice land, and we want to split this. So for example, if we use a microservice, we can use a different database. Maybe SQL is not that practical for analytics, so we need to use a different database. But it, that is also an example, uh, an advantage, sorry, is that we now don't burden the SQL database with when we use analytics, because it has its own database. But there is a problem here, and that's around here in the middle. Analytics API. What's an analytics API? I made it up, but it's what you need to get that data over there, right? Because analytics is not, not something that's a small piece of data. That's usually you need everything. So do you, do you make an API call that you just get all the data and then do your analytics? Technically works. Uh, in practice, I don't really see that happening because it's, it's basically what batch is. Um, but it is uh, very much of a burden to the source database. And it is, if you look at this, it's generally you could say that we should have left it in the original service. So you can also go more granular and that you can just query specific pieces of data and you can list data, also fine. But uh, you have the same problem. You are querying a lot of data and actually the performance might be even worse. So can we do this? Is, 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 is this fair? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice attempt, but it's not really a microservice in the sense that we are not ab abstracting away the database that's inside the original service. We're exposing the guts of the database all the way out. So this is cheating, even though it will work just fine. But then again, you could also have left it in the original service. So why, what we end up usually doing is that we have the, the two services and we have some magic. We have some tool that replicates the data from one into the other. So those, the, the, those tools, you, you probably know them, like dbvisit, DB visit, you have like uh, uh, Golden Gate from Oracle, hugely expensive. And what they do is they take the data from one database and they put them in the other, which is a valid thing to do, but that leaves out the fact that we might not want to do it, use a SQL database here. And that's pretty limited. There's some leeway, you can tune it a little bit, but generally you need to put the data away in the same shape you found it. And that is not good for analytics generally. So, yeah. Uh, another problem is, uh, I, I addressed the first two. Um, the last one, this doesn't scale. If you have two servers, it's fine. Three, okay, four, and the rest, no way. You'll just spend all your time pumping data back and forth. So there is a, a model that works. Event-driven microservices. Who knows them? Good, 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 good. So event-driven microservices have really gotten a lot more popularity. Like anything new in our industry, it's nothing new. It has been around for ages, but now all of a sudden th people talk about it. Um, so what's it about? Instead of having services that ask each other things, we have services that tell things. They push events, they say, this happened, this happened. And they listen to topics and they hear what other services said. They don't care who said it, and they also don't care who listens to what they say. So it's a bit more decoupled. And it's generally backed by a pu published subscribe bus. So how would it look in our as example? So in our, in our uh, main service, we will just listen to all the change in the database. We will push a message onto the bus. And it will just post it there. And the analytics will just listen to all the, all the changes. And it can build up its own database in whatever form it wants. Yeah, so that's... Uh, 
That's basically what we do here. And, it, and this scales very nicely, because you can plug in something else that also listens and does something else, but neither of these two need to know about that. So that scales pretty nicely. Uh, so for that, um, for that uh, bus, we generally use Kafka. Who have you heard of Kafka? Everybody, that's good. Wow, nearly everybody. So really quick, Kafka, a persistent message bus. So if you post a message, you'll probably not lose it. In a nutshell, you can put a lot of messages through it, thousands, millions per second. Uh, uh, an important point that, uh, compared to some other buses is that it's okay if there are some fast clients and some slow clients. So some consume it quickly and some might take a week. And that's okay. And that's really powerful because especially in like the analytics, you don't want to slow down your application because you want to do analytics. So you, you just have, if that analytics, analytics part gets behind for a day, well, so be it. It's not that bad. So, um, we use this for our client. Uh, uh, it's a small, well, it's, not, it's a small company. We do, uh, we work for sports associations in the Netherlands. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, around for a while. It's not exactly a greenfield application. We have a lot of regrets in our code already. We have been around 10 years uh, planning, planning competitions and everything and uh, all the stuff around matches. Um, we have about a million players in mostly like football and handball and some others, 4,000 clubs, 40,000 matches every week. It's a spiky load, but it's predictable. Um, our traditional stack was an Oracle database with uh, Java-based application servers and a whole bunch of clients. Nothing special here. So we wanted to move from a, uh, from a club-centric, that the clubs did all their uh, changes on our database to a personal level, so that instead of the 4,000 clubs, the 1 million players were our clients. So that kind of implies quite a big uh, upgrade in the amount of traffic we're going to get. Oracle was not going to scale. Or maybe it is, but we don't have that kind of money. So uh, we need to do something like this. So what we started with was this, exactly what we talked about. We have our Oracle database, we listen to the changes. And we have the Kafka bus, and here we insert those uh, messages into a MongoDB database, because that one scales a bit better. Uh, this was really easy and worked really well until I, the, the, the client application started using that database, and they informed me that that database really, really sucked. And it sucks be because we are using a relational data model. We copy it one-on-one -on -one to a database that can't do joins. And, and that, that, that hurts, because uh, that's assumption of a relational database, that you can join all the data you need. The advantage of a document database is that you can put a lot more in a document, but we didn't do that because we were copying one-on-one. -on -one. So that's also not really great. So we, we had a bit of an issue there. So. Um, if we take this as an example, you have a SQL, you have some persons, you have some phone numbers and communication things that are associated. In SQL, you would just query both in one query. No problem. In, in MongoDB, you would want something like this, that you put the, the phone numbers, et cetera, inside the document, right? But um, to do that, we need to join those change streams from two different tables. Right? Because um, we don't, we need to join them, and, but we don't know when those changes are going to show up. So there are, might be millions here and millions there, and we need to join the right one. And, we can, and in the meantime, we need to remember everything that happens there before we can join them and then continue on. Yeah? So we can, do, uh, we can use Kafka Streams for that. That's a streaming engine, basically. And that does that. But it's, it's a whole lot harder and heavier than you might think. Because basically, you need to store everything that happened. And um, uh, Kafka Streams uses RocksDB for that. But that's a huge beast. There's a lot of data there. So uh, it's actually a lot harder than it looks. And this is just one join. And if you have more joins behind each other, it's, 
the documents get bigger, the load gets heavier. So it's actually not a trivial thing to do, it's easy as it sounds. So if you look at our specific case, we have like half a billion rows of SQL data, but that required, that turns into some non, yeah, pretty serious amounts of data to move around. And if we want to build that entire data set to our replicate set, it takes hours or days. So once it's warmed up and every pending change is gone, and then it will just process all the messages, then it's fine, then it will be quick. But before that, it's a lot of work. Also, when developing stream uh, transformations, it's, uh, it's harder than you're used to when you're just um, doing stateless code. If you're doing something stateless, like a, a web page that gets something from a database, you can edit your code and you press F5, and then you see if it does what you expect it to do. And, it, and you can repeat that. But for this, if I change the code that creates a new set, actually, I should really redo the whole batch, right? So that, that's not a very trivial thing. So you can cut some corners. You can have nice small data sets. But it's a, it's a whole lot more work than when, you are used, uh, when you're developing stateless, stateless code. Um, so we went in production the day before yesterday. So it was quite a, uh, uh, an effort to go here and pre prepare to say how great it is before you actually know. Uh, it behaves well. I lost quite a bit of sleep, but uh, it works. Uh, Kafka Streams was in a really rough state when we started, and now it's much better. Um, a problem is, though, is that the average database nowadays is not really used to being a team player. Like, every database expects I am all you will ever need, and I will do everything for you. So uh, that, that, that translates in the fact that if you want to capture all the changes from a database, for example, a SQL database, how do you capture that? It's possible. There, every database, there's a way in to capture the change. You can use triggers, or you can tail the archive log in Oracle, but it's never really an API. You only have to fight for it. And to stream the data in is also not something they really help you with. But now we've done the hard part. Once we have this, um, this infrastructure in place, we can start using fun database. Because we have all the streams of data, we can grab some random database off the street, plug it in, and see what happens. Because that's, that has gone pretty easy now. So I'll go through a small parade of, uh, of databases, which might make sense. For example, Elasticsearch. We feed a lot of our data now into Elasticsearch, and that gives you the ability to search in an unstructured way. Something like SQL doesn't really like searching in an unstructured way. It can do it if you really force it to, but it's, it doesn't really work that smoothly. Also, you re reduce the load of your source database. And often, users nowadays, they expect to be able to Google for anything. So they want a Google-like interface within an application. You just write down some random words, and it will somehow find what you're talking about without saying what it, what it is you're specifying. So users kind of like that. Neo4j, graph database. Graphs are amazing. It's, a, it's really like a bit of a rabbit hole once you go into graph database, because they are most of the graph database people are a bit weird in the head, but they, they do r really powerful things. And uh, some analytics, for example, are really easy to express in graphs and not so much in rela relational database. For example, if we want to know how often you play to, against another person in another team, if you think about it as a graph traversal problem, it's not that hard. If you write down the SQL statement, it's two pages. So even if it's not exactly something you couldn't do before, it's so much easier. Firebase, who knows Firebase? Nice, it's a sort of a backend as a server. It, it, it looks like, a, it's basically a JSON file in the sky. You have like, the model of the database, this is a JSON file. And you can insert stuff in different paths in the, inside a JSON document. And there are some really powerful client libraries that you can uh, subscribe to certain parts of the, 
of the of the file, and when you change it, your web page will change, or your mobile app will change, because all the notification will be done for you. None of these databases make sense to use as your only database. Maybe for really simple cases, but generally you don't want to put your whole enterprise business in a JSON file in the sky. But for specific things, if you want to publish something, these things make it a whole lot easier. And now we have the time to do it. Uh, another way of looking at it, sort of the inverse way of looking at it, if we take all the infrastructure we have now with all the database we've plugged in, you could just draw a box around it and give it a name, and then you have a database. And that's called a multi-model database. Microsoft has a nice one that just came out a few months ago, Cosmos DB. It's too early for me to tell if it will go anywhere, but it's a really interesting take on where we are going with databases. And maybe that makes a lot more sense than the stuff I said, but I'll believe it when I see it. So, um, so in, uh, in closing, um, I have argued today that databases are better as a team than as an individual. And uh, you need to, to realize that going from a database, a single database to a team of database, is no joke. There is a lot of pain you will endure on the way because you go to a more eventual consistency model that will hurt. There is a lot of data moving around and you just need a quite a bit more, uh, more power, but it is, uh, it is worth it. And also, it is really nice to use the right tool for the job. I mean, if you really can write except cipher query in Neo4j to exactly specify which graph traversal you'll do, and it works, that is so much nicer than just trying to make that database do what you want to do, and struggling and struggling, at some point you'll succeed, but by that time you won't really enjoy the victory anymore. Um, and I would also like to, for you all to check how much the use of the tools you use influences how you think. And you can only do that by trying different tools. If you always use only SQL, you will think that SQL is all you need. And if you start playing around, you will get a lot more input in what makes sense to, and why. So um, that, and finally, uh, the, the last thought I want to leave you with is that nobody uh, uses a Swiss Army knife professionally. Right? If you, if you go to the, you, you bring your car to the mechanic, they won't show up with a Swiss army knife. Um, if you, a, a chef in the kitchen won't use a Swiss army knife. Nobody uses a Swiss army knife. I am pretty sure that even soldiers in Switzerland don't use a Swiss army knife. So, um, in that respect, why should we use a Swiss army knife? And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, we have a whole lot of questions and discussions and all sorts of things happening on Slack. Oh my God. So I'm going to try and choose a few, uh, a few good ones. Um, first of all, you talked about how you had to use Oracle as your SQL database mm -hmm. in that piece. Yeah. Um, if you were sort of starting that from scratch and you had the choice, what would you use instead? And specifically, somebody asked, for a small scale web app, what ah. would be your database of choice for that role that's not feature bloated and performs well? Um, I, I think I would go with MongoDB now okay. because uh, it has done everything I wanted from it. Uh, you never really know until you really got your hands dirty with the database. They all look great on paper, mm -hmm. so uh, you need to feel it a little bit. But in general, you will, all, you will always have a situation where you have made choices and that might be right and might be wrong, mm -hmm. but you always have to go on and deal with your choices. Okay. Um, there was a question asking whether you looked at existing solutions before you sort of rolled out your own version with the calf screams and stuff. Um, for example, uh, Datomic. Um, if so, why did you reject them? I don't know all of them. Okay, obviously. Um, but uh, we, we had that solution in place, but it, it, the, the fact remained that we were uh, 
that we really wanted some more freedom, actually. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, yeah, so most of the database solutions are point to point. And we wanted, once you get that change stream into a, into a Kafka system, you can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. And I believe, and I still do, that that investment was worth it. Yes. Um, so once the databases are set up and you've got data streaming in, all of that makes sense. What happens then in terms of adding a new service, loading all of that data in? Is that a big ETL job? And also, if you change migrations on those databases and want to redo things, do you put things back into the streams? How does that work? Yeah, so I, I glossed over a whole lot of things. Of course. Uh, um, but generally, Kafka can hold a lot of data. You can hold terabytes just inside the streams. So uh, there are some tricks to make, uh, make the size of data not completely go berserk. But apart from that, uh, you can just put everything in a queue and you just restart the, the processing of the queue. Mm -hmm. And depending on the database, it will refill. And it will put some load on Kafka, but not so much on the source database. That will be unaware of this happening. OK. Um, how do you or can you write integration and end, end tests across this whole stack to test everything's working? Uh, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult because of eventual consistency. That makes pretty much everything difficult. But um, what we do is generally just periodically push changes in a certain table that don't have really are semantically important. Mm -hmm. And we check how, how long that change takes to end at the other side. And with that, we can monitor if there is any lag. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, this is an interesting question. So the, I'll read the whole question. You've answered the first bit. Does, does Kafka store a log of all the events, which I think you've said yeah, yes, yeah, effectively? It does. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some tricks there, but yes. Yeah. Um, does that then mean that all of the actual databases are effectively a projection of uh, the Kafka streams, and that your Kafka streams now become your single point of truth? Yeah, you could, you could say that. Um, I don't see many people who are so brave to remove the original database because no. you technically could do that. But um, yeah, that's basically the, this is called event sourcing, mm -hmm. that you just really think that the events are the thing that's important and you can create anything out of that. And that's like the other uh, approach to take to this subject. Mm -hmm. But I started from the more the practical thing. You want to replicate data. But yes, that's definitely true. Awesome. There's more questions on Slack, but I'm going to leave it there for yeah, now. But I'll please do Slack dig in and join in. It's been great. Thank you yeah, very much, Frank. Thank you.